Jerusalem, the most sacred city in all the world. It holds incredible spiritual importance to Jews, Christians and Muslims. It's the site of the Wailing Wall, the Last Supper and Muhammad's ascension to heaven. It's home to over a thousand synagogues, a hundred churches and 70 mosques. Jerusalem means city of peace. But even with all these religious buildings and the millions of pilgrims who visit and worship in them, down through the ages, it's been a place of violence and turmoil. During its long history, Jerusalem has been attacked 52 times, captured and recaptured 44 times, besieged 23 times and destroyed twice. One of those intense periods of tension and turmoil involved the Crusades. They were a series of religious wars fought during the Middle Ages between the Arabs who controlled Jerusalem and European armies. Crusaders captured Jerusalem in 1099. They wanted to ensure that the city was safe for Christian pilgrims. During the hundred years that they were in control of Jerusalem, Christian settlers from the West set about rebuilding the shrines and churches associated with the life of Christ. One of the loveliest of all the Crusader buildings is St. Anne's Church that was built in 1140. Something incredible happened in the grounds of this church that convinces me that peace can be achieved in this troubled land. And not just internationally and religiously, but also personally. Right here, a man found the secret of true peace. He found true meaning and purpose in life. His story will encourage you and inspire you. The Church of St. Anne is the most characteristic and best preserved Crusader church in Jerusalem. It marks the traditional site of the home of Jesus' maternal grandparents, Anne and Joachim, and the birthplace of his mother, Mary. It's located just north of the Temple Mount, about 50 meters inside St. Stephen's or Lion's Gate in the eastern wall of the old city of Jerusalem. It used to be called the Sheep Gate because this was where sheep were brought to the temple to be sacrificed. The church stands in a courtyard with trees, shrubs and flowers. Its peace and tranquility contrast with the bustling streets and alleys of the Muslim quarter outside. St. Anne's Church was built by the Crusaders in 1140. The strong lines and thick walls give the church a fortress-like appearance and is renowned for the acoustics in the chapel. It was built over a cave where the Crusaders believed that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was born. Unlike other churches in Jerusalem, St. Anne's wasn't destroyed after the Muslims conquered the city in 1189. Instead, it was turned into an Islamic law school by the Sultan Saladin. His name still appears in the Arabic inscription above the main entrance. After two centuries, the building was abandoned. At the end of the Crimean War between the Ottoman Turkish Empire and Russia, the Sultan of Turkey gave the site to the French government in gratitude for its help during the war. The churchyard contains one of the saddest places on earth. The compound contains pools of water that archaeologists have discovered are the pools of Bethesda. These pools attracted invalids, blind, lame and paralysed, who believed that when the water was stirred up, it contained healing powers. But in reality, it was a place of despair for the disabled who congregated here. One of them who languished here had been an invalid for 38 years. 
He lay here for a long time, watching the world go by, unable to be a part of it. Life had lost all purpose and meaning, yet he was the same person inside that he'd always been. He had the same talents, the same insights, but his mind just couldn't make his body work anymore. And so he'd been condemned to the sidelines. He'd lost the freedom to move around. He'd lost the freedom to participate in the activities of everyday life. Worst of all, he'd fixed all his hope, every bit of the hope he could still muster on the wrong thing. But then something happened that changed his life forever. Jerusalem was in the midst of one of its great festivals, one that drew thousands of pilgrims from all over Israel to the city's holy temple. Among those crowding the streets and the temple court was Jesus. He'd gone there to participate in the ancient rituals like any faithful Jew. But on this particular day, he was looking for a break from all the elaborate ceremonies. It was a high Sabbath, full of pomp and pageantry. And Jesus took a walk to get some fresh air. He also wanted to get away from the priests and scribes who were always challenging him, always trying to trap him with some trick question. Jesus found himself in constant conflict with the legalistic religion of his day. As he strolled, Jesus was soon drawn to another environment, the places where the poor and afflicted huddled. This teacher from Galilee found himself here in one of the darkest and saddest corners of Jerusalem, the Pool of Bethesda. It was dark because it attracted human misery. It attracted people who had to hope against hope. Jesus walked through the covered colonnade surrounding the spring-fed pool and looked around. He gazed intently at the human wreckage hovering near the water. Pale bodies, racked by fatal diseases, lay on filthy mats. Their faces were turned toward the motionless surface of this pool. The blind crouched on stone porches, ready to spring toward the first sound of water lapping on the stone. The maimed sprawled in a variety of positions, trying to keep their good limbs ready for action. And the most pathetic, those completely paralyzed, stared helplessly up at the cold columns. Jesus sensed what these individuals were feeling. He sensed something of what it was like to wait here each day, day after day, and watch the sun crawl across the sky overhead. And he wanted to heal them all right then, right here. But he realized that would cause a problem. To perform such a mighty miracle during this feast day in a Jerusalem bustling with pilgrims would bring him into conflict with the religious leaders. Still, Jesus' gaze fastened on one particular case, a hopeless case, a man who'd been an invalid for 38 years. He'd been lying there watching people come and go for almost four decades. Once, he'd been as strong and active as any other man. Once he'd been a part of the life of Jerusalem. He could have worked. He could have raised a family. But his illness condemned him to a life on the sidelines. He wasn't a part of anything or anyone anymore. He just had to lie there as life passed him by. When Jesus looked into this grey, grim face, he felt he just had to perform one miracle. He had to try to save this man from his misery. Have you ever felt trapped on the sidelines? You probably haven't been paralysed for 38 years, like that man by the pool of Bethesda. But a lot of us go through tough times in our lives when we do feel sidelined, when we feel life is passing us by, and we can't do anything about it. Perhaps it's a chronic illness, something that keeps returning over and over again. You've tried all kinds of remedies, but nothing seems to work. You've been disappointed so many times, but just when you start feeling that maybe, just maybe the disease is under control, it flares up again and lays you low. 
Perhaps you're recovering from a divorce or the loss of a loved one. You've lost something precious and the breakup of that relationship seems to have broken up your whole world. You trudge through each day. You go through the motions, but you feel disconnected. You're not really a part of life around you. Perhaps you've just lost your job. You're desperately trying to find something new, but you keep running into closed doors. Things fall through and you watch all the other people heading off to work in the morning, all the other people busy with their routines, and you feel terribly sidelined. Life is passing you by. This paralyzed man by the pool of Bethesda represented the sorrow of the sidelined. He embodied all their frustration. He looked down at his limbs every day. He saw that everything was there and yet nothing worked. He didn't want to simply adjust to that situation. He didn't want to simply just cope. He wanted to get moving again. This is the need that Jesus wanted to meet as he approached the man lying on his filthy mat here at the pool of Bethesda. But the great physician faced a problem. The problem was this man's faith. That's right, the problem was his faith. Why? He was looking in the wrong direction. When Jesus walked up to him and graciously asked, do you want to be made well? This is what the man replied in John chapter five and verse seven. Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. This paralyzed man had placed his faith in the same superstition as everyone else waiting by that pool. It was said that on occasion, an angel from heaven would come down to stir up the water here. And whoever got into the pool first would be healed of whatever disease they had. Now, it's not uncommon for spring-fed pools to bubble up sometimes due simply to the flow of water. But the desperate people here at Bethesda believed or tried to believe that an angel was involved and that healing would follow if they got into the pool after the angel stirred it up. This disabled man spent hours staring at the surface of the pool. Some other veterans of Bethesda crawled close to the water. They crawled up next to it when the breeze smelled like sheep. The Sheepgate Market lay close by, and they imagined that a breeze strong enough to bring them the pungent odours of the animals might just be strong enough to help that angel disturb the pool. Others had trained themselves to detect a faint rumbling underground that was usually followed by heated water bubbling up to the surface. Tragically, they were all looking in the wrong direction and Jesus longed to do something about it. You know, when we're sidelined and life loses its purpose, it's easy to look in the wrong direction. It's very easy to invest our faith in the wrong thing. We want the problem to go away now. We want a magical solution now. So people often just bury themselves in alcohol or drugs. They find a way to escape from the pain, but they're looking for help in the wrong direction, placing their faith in the wrong things. Jesus had to deal with this problem. He had to deal with this man's misplaced faith. So Jesus didn't respond to him in the way he hoped. There was a request hidden in his statement I have no man to put me into the pool. He'd managed to persuade acquaintances to carry him to Bethesda, but no one wanted to hang around all day waiting for the water to move. Maybe, just maybe, this kind stranger would give him a push at the right time. That's all he could hope for because his faith was fixed so intently on the magical pool of water. But Christ wanted him to look elsewhere. He wanted the man to look into his face, to make a connection. So he didn't answer the man's request. Instead, he gave him what seemed to be a perfectly ridiculous command. Get up, pick up your mat and walk. Well, 
Jesus might as well have told the stone columns here in the pool to dance in a circle. There was no way in the world this man could get up and walk. He'd been paralyzed for 38 years. But something happened when this startled man looked intently into the face of Jesus Christ. Who is this man, he wondered, who can speak such words? And suddenly those muted nerve endings and shriveled limbs responded as if they'd taken on a life of their own. He wanted to obey this impossible command. He struggled to his feet and suddenly 38 years of immobility vanished. He'd been saved from the sidelines. I'd like you to think for a moment about whatever problem has condemned you to the sidelines. Think about how you react when you feel life is passing you by. Think about where you tend to place your faith. Have you been looking in the right direction? Are you seeing the face of God in that direction? Or are you obsessing over some quick fix, some magical solution that forms a detour around Him? Sometimes we remain stuck on the sidelines because we get stuck staring at the wrong thing. And what Christ wants to do, first of all, is to get us looking into His face. Please, He says to all those who feel paralyzed by life, look at me first. The loss of a job doesn't have to condemn you to the sidelines. Chronic illness doesn't have to condemn you to the sidelines. The loss of a loved one doesn't have to condemn you to the sidelines. There is a way out, but it all starts by looking in the right direction. Remember that Christ didn't answer the paralyzed man in the way he had hoped. Instead, he gave him something much better. And sometimes our fervent prayers for an immediate solution get in the way of our experiencing a bigger and better solution. Sometimes we keep begging God for an immediate physical healing when He wants first to enable us to experience a more important emotional healing. Sometimes we keep begging God for a certain job when He wants to open up a whole new career for us. Sometimes we demand that God make so-and-so fall in love with us when He has someone much better in mind. Focusing completely on the immediate solution can get in the way of God giving us the bigger solution. We're so fixed on the surface of the pool that we don't notice the greatest healer of all time reaching out His hand to us. First, look at Jesus. That's what the paralytic had to do. Invest your faith in the right place. Begin a relationship with Him. Then He can lead you away from the sidelines. He can make you part of His abundant life again. He can get you back in the race. Listen to how Paul pictured the race of life in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. How do we get off the sidelines and into the race? By first looking at Jesus, by first fixing our eyes on Jesus. Looking at Jesus creates faith. It creates trust. It creates confidence. But there's a second thing this man had to do. There's a second thing we all must do to get off the sidelines. This man listened to Jesus. He entered into a dialogue with this stranger bending over him. He heard the question, do you want to be made well? And he listened to the command, rise, take up your bed and walk. After we look, we too must listen. After we fix our eyes on the object of our faith, on Jesus, then we must listen to him speak. And we must listen regularly. How? How do we listen? by spending time in prayer and the study of the Bible. That's how we communicate with Christ, and that's how He communicates with us. Listen to how the Bible pictures this. 
In Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 and 5, our Lord describes the relationship. He says, He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. How do we listen as a disciple morning by morning? By listening to the Word of God. But letting Him speak His wisdom and encouragement to us through the Word takes time. It takes a personal commitment. But the experience of having God speak to you is worth any investment. How do you get off the sidelines? First, look at Jesus. Then listen to Jesus. That's what the man by the pool did. And finally, he did one more thing. He started to live in Jesus. When Jesus commanded him to rise, what did he do? He got up. God's power within this man enabled him to get up. When Jesus commanded him to take up his mat, what did he do? He took it up. He walked away from that place of despair and sickness with the mat under his arm. He was responding to Jesus. He was living in Jesus. That's the third thing we must do to get off the sidelines. Live in Jesus. Listen to what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Dead to sin, alive to God. The paralytic turned away completely from his old life. He wasn't going to hang around the pool of Bethesda. He wasn't going to stay there anymore. Too many bad memories. Too many long hours of misery. Every fibre in his body was responding to that command to rise and walk. It was exhilarating. We need to look at Jesus. We need to listen to Jesus. And we need to live in Jesus. We need to respond wholeheartedly to what He tells us. We need to base our lives on His teaching. That's how we get off the sidelines. That's how we get into the race of life. You may feel paralyzed by forces much greater than yourself. You may feel helpless in the middle of your personal storm. But Jesus says, I can save you from the sidelines and I can do more. Friend, look up right now. Start looking in the right direction. Look deeply into the face of Jesus. He can take all your scars and turn them into stars. He can take your tragedies and He can turn them into triumphs. He can take your broken dreams and your frustrated hopes and your disappointments and God can turn them around. He can make something beautiful in your life. Look to Jesus. That's the first step out of the sidelines. Friend, right now, listen to Jesus. Listen to Him tell you how important you are. Listen to Him tell you how much you mean to Him. And friends, by faith, reach out to Him right now. By faith, say to Him, Lord, I do believe that you are building something out of the shambles of my life and that you can save me from the sidelines. Why not reach out to Him right now as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you can save us from the sidelines. We're tired of seeing life rush past us. We're tired of being paralyzed by the misfortunes. Please help us to invest our faith in the Great Physician. Enable us now to obey your command, rise, take up our mats and walk. We give you permission to begin working your will in our lives, to begin those first brush strokes that will result in a masterpiece. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. A hopeless, paralysed man found Jesus here. He was in a desperate situation. For 38 years, he had hope beyond hope. But yet here at this very spot, Christ touched him 
and he was made whole. I'm so glad that the saving, rescuing power of Jesus is unlimited. I'm so glad that he can still save people from the sidelines. Today, you can find that Christ. If you are struggling with the challenges and stress of everyday life and would like to experience God's unconditional love, if you are looking for ways to live a better life and want to find inner peace and true happiness, if you'd like to get closer to God, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our viewers today. It's the booklet, We Can Believe the Bible. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to receive the gift we have for you today. Here's the information you need. Phone or text us at 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website www.tij.tv to request today's free offer and we'll send it to you totally free of charge and with no obligation. So don't delay. Call or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website to request today's offer. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia, or PO Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. So don't delay. Call or text to request today's free offer and we'll send it to you totally free of charge and with no obligation. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed today's journey to the Pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem and our reflections on Jesus' power to change lives and bring peace and happiness, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, remember the ultimate destination of life's journey. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away.